Hey guys, my name is JC and today we're playing Radadrabic of Urborg. This is an aristocrat's deck that aims to make multiple copies of legendary creatures to take its opponents out. If this seems like the kind of deck you'd like to play, then make sure to stop by the channel where we have a deck deck discussing all of the included cards as well as the overall strategy. Let's see what Radadrabic of Urborg can really do. Alright guys, let's see who we're playing today. We have the Sliver Queen, we have Odric Lunark Marshall, and we also have Maelstrom Wanderer. Okay, if we look at our opening hand, I'm not really a big fan. I mean, one more land would be great to be able to go into Braids, but Culling the Week being our only ramp piece, and we've got two quite expensive creatures. We can't keep this, so let's mulligan. Unfortunately, that second hand is looking a lot worse, so there's not real much choice here. We're going to have to mulligan again and go down to six. All right, well, that's looking much better. It's still not a great hand, but it's much more capable than the other ones, and I don't want to go any lower, so we'll keep this. And I'm going to bottom Hope of Giripur. All right, we draw Yeheni Undying Partisan for turn. That's quite a good draw. So let's just play our Command Tower for turn, and we'll pass it to our opponents. Sliver Queen just plays a tap land for turn, and that is them done for turn. Odric also plays a tap land for turn. It's a Hall of the Bandit Lord, so they are going to be able to give a creature haste at the cost of some life. And that's them done. Maelstrom Wanderer plays a land for turn. But they're just going to leave it there. And we draw a land for turn. So let's just play our planes and we'll pass it over. Sliver Queen plays another tap land. And that's going to be it for them. Odric plays a land. A Flagstones of Troke here. And now they cast Selfless Spirit. You can sacrifice it and creatures you control gain indestructible until end of turn. Now they do have haste so they can go to combat. And they swing in towards the Maelstrom Wanderer player. They'll take the two damage, and that is it for the Odric player. Maelstrom Wanderer plays a land. They do shock themselves, and now they cast an Arcane Signet. And that is it for them. We draw a Dark Ritual. Well, that's not a bad draw. We just have to get some other juicier creatures into our hand. So I think we'll start by playing our Phyrexian Tower, and then we'll get Yeheni on board. Now we'll move to combat, and we'll follow suit with the Odric player by attacking the Maelstrom Wanderer player. And then we're just going to pass the turn over. We could have attempted to cast our commander there, but I want to hold on to it for the moment and keep the Dark Ritual for when we really need it. Now Sliver Queen plays a land for turn, and now they cast Phyrexian Arena. At the beginning of your upkeep, you draw a card and you lose one life. And that is it for their turn. Odric plays a fetch land. They crack it straight away. They put a planes into play. And now they cast Adeline Resplendent Cathar. Adeline Resplendent Cathar's power is equal to the number of creatures you control. Whenever you attack for each opponent, create a 1-1 one, one white human creature token that's tapped and attacking that player or a planeswalker they control. So they will get to keep all the tokens here. Selfless Spirit goes towards the Maelstrom Wanderer player, and so does Adeline. So the Odric player's definitely got their eyes firmly fixed on Maelstrom Wanderer. That does trigger Adeline. They're going to make three 1-1s, one which means the rest of us will also take an additional 1 damage. Wouldn't mind having an Adeline ourselves at the moment. She tends to do a lot of work in our deck. And that is it for them. Maelstrom Wanderer plays a land for turn. And now they cast a Felwar Stone. Then they follow that up by Morphin a Creature. And that is going to be it for them. We draw Dark Prophecy for turn. Okay, well at least it's nice to see a bit of card draw. So we'll play our Swamp. And then I think now's the time to resolve our Commander. Now we'll move to combat. This time we're going to hit the Sliver Queen. Damage goes through. And I think we'll pass the turn over there. Now, Phyrexian Arena does trigger on the Sliver Queen's upkeep. They lose a life and draw a card. Now they play a tap land for turn. And now they cycle a Sheltered Thicket. And it looks like that's it for their turn. Now, Odric starts their turn by casting a Mox Diamond. So they do have to discard a land card for that. And they do. Well, now we should see their commander come down. Which does mean that we're not going to be able to block the human tokens. Because Odric is going to give all their creatures flying. They also play a Lotus Veil. When it ETB, sacrifice two untapped lands, and it's a land that taps for three mana of any one color. That also triggers their flagstones of Trochir. So they get to search the library for a planes card, put it on the battlefield, tap, then shuffle. So Odric is certainly starting to accelerate pretty far ahead here. And now they do, they cast their commander, Odric Lunark Marshal. At the beginning of each combat, creatures you control gain first strike until end of turn if that creature has first strike. The same is true for flying, death touch, double strike, haste, hexproof, indestructible, lifelink, menace, reach, sculpt, trample, and vigilance. A lot of keywords. So their creatures currently have Flying, Haste, and Vigilance. They move to combat. Let's see where they go. Let's see if the pressure is still going to be on Maelstrom Wanderer. And it looks like it is. 
That is good news for us. It buys us a little more time. And it looks like they're actually sending Odric towards the Sliver Queen player. And then the humans are getting dispersed around evenly. They also send their other humans in towards the Sliver Queen player. So it seems we're the only ones that are getting away relatively unscathed. Damage goes through. Maelstrom Wanderer is down to 16, so they need to get their act together pretty quick, otherwise they're going to be out of this game. And that is it for the Odric player. Maelstrom Wanderer plays a land for turn. It comes into play tapped. Now Maelstrom Wanderer starts off by casting Kiora, Behemoth Beckoner. Whenever a creature with power 4 or greater ETBs under your control, draw a card and you can negative 1 to untap target permanent. And it looks like that's it for them. Alright, well we need to hope for a pretty good draw here, because we are starting to fall behind. Just with what the Odric player is doing there. We do draw a land, unfortunately. So we'll play our land for turn. Then we'll follow that up by casting our Luminous Broodmoth. That'll at least give us a little bit of protection in the air, especially against Adeline, which is going to be quite big. And as much as I'd like to hold on to the Dark Ritual, I think we need to advance our board state, so I'm going to cast that and get our Dark Prophecy into play. Now one thing we can hope for at the moment is the Sliver Queen player might be able to cast their commander next turn, so they may be able to start to establish themselves as a little bit of a threat and start to stretch the Odric player's resources a little bit. So this is a case where we actually hope one of our opponents does a little bit better. But we're just going to pass the turn there. We're not going to go to combat. And we'll see what the Sliver Queen player has for us. On the Sliver Queen's upkeep for Exian Arena triggers, they play a tap land for turn, which does gain them one life. So it looks like we're not going to see the Sliver Queen come down this turn. And now they cast Horizon Chimera. It's a 3-2 with Flying and Trample Flash. Whenever you draw a card, you gain one life. And that is it for them. Odric starts by casting a Sword of Feast and Famine. A crit creature gets plus 2, plus 2, has protection from black and green. Whenever a crit creature deals combat damage to a player, that player discards a card and you untap all lands you control. Going to be very good with all the flyers they have on board. And they move to equip the Sword of Feast and Famine to their commander. So now Odric is a 5-5. They move to combat, Odric triggers... Alright, let's see where these attacks go. This may be the end of the game for the Maelstrom Wanderer player, we'll see. So Odric's going towards the Sliver Queen player. I have a feeling we may get a little bit coming our way now that our board state is starting to get set up. Luminous Broodmoth tends to set off a few alarms. Adeline's going towards Maelstrom Wanderer. It looks like we're getting a couple of the humans coming our way. That's four of them already. Now another human's going towards the Sliver Queen player. This one's going towards Kiora. And where is the Selfless Spirit going? That's also going towards Kiora. Now that does trigger Adeline. They make another 3 one, 1 human tokens. Each one of those will go at a different opponent. We'll block one of the 1-1s. One ones. So does our opponent. So that does trigger our Yeheni and Sword of Feast and Famine. That does force the Sliver Queen player to discard a card. Odric does untap all their lands. Let's see what they have for us in their second main phase. And now they cast a Grand Abolisher. During your turn, your opponents can't cast spells or activate abilities of artifacts, creatures, or enchantments. And now they follow that up with Archon of Emeria. Each player can't cast more than one spell each turn, and non-basic lands your opponent's control enter the battlefield tapped. Well, that is a good piece to have on board to slow down the rest of the table, seeing as they're in the strongest position. And that is their turn done. So it's not looking good for the rest of the table here. The Odric player looks like they might be able to run away with it, unless one of the other players plays a board wipe, or we draw really well here. Maelstrom Wanderer plays a land for turn, it comes into play tapped. And they just decide to scoop it up there, so it looks like they didn't draw into anything. So now there's only three of us left. Now we draw Shieldra the Apocalypse. Would have been really nice to have had that a turn or two earlier. So we'll play our land for turn. It does enter tapped. Next we'll cast our Shieldred. Now we'll sacrifice Shieldred using our Phyrexian Tower. That will trigger our Dark Prophecy, Luminous Brood Moth and Commander. So Luminous Brood Moth will bring Shieldred back. And now she has Flying, which is quite important in this game at the moment. Radadrabic makes us a clone copy. And now we do get to draw a card and lose a life, which we've been in desperate need for card draw. A Carrion Feeder. And now because of both our Shieldreds, we gain four life for that one card we drew. Now we will move to combat. Odric does trigger. We're going to send Yeheni towards the Odric player. They decide to block with their commander. So what we'll do in response, we'll sacrifice our Shieldred. That triggers Dark Prophecy and Luminous Broodmoth. We draw an Elisil Core. We will gain two life. And now Yeheni gains Indestructible. And just realized that I did sacrifice the wrong Shieldred there. I sacrificed the token when I was meant to sacrifice the other one. That's, a, that's an unfortunate mistake there. I was hoping to make another token copy of it. But these things happen. And we'll just have to pass the turn there. Well, I have a feeling that Odric's probably going to send nearly everything they have our way. 
because of our Shieldred. So we've really got to hope that the Sliver Queen player does something big this turn. Now on their upkeep, Phyrexian Arena does trigger. Now on their draw step, Shieldred does trigger. They lose two life. Then they gain a life because of their Chimera. Now they lose another two life because of the card they draw for turn. Then they gain that life back. They play a land for turn. And now they cast an Utter End, targeting the Selfless Spirit. Well, that will remove all the flying from their creatures. But unfortunately, because they do have an Archon of Ameria there, they will just gain that right back. Now, Odric does sacrifice it in response to give their creatures indestructible until end of turn. But now we move to their end step, and Odric actually casts Path to Exile. It was the one card in their hand targeting our Luminous Broodmoth. Well, we're going to use your handy to sacrifice it here. That'll protect it. We'll put it to the graveyard. That does trigger our Dark Prophecy. So we're going to draw a card and lose a life. But then Shieldred's going to gain us two life back. Would have really loved to have had two Shieldreds out now. Really regretted making that play mistake before. Yehenny does gain Indestructible. And that fizzles the path to exile. And now we move to the Odric player's turn. Now on Odric's draw step, they do lose two life. Now they move to equip their Sword of Feast and Famine to Adeline. So that's going to guarantee that they get a lot more damage through to us. Now they move to combat. And as I suspected, everything's coming our way. Except for Odric, they don't want Shieldra to be able to kill it. But no, they do decide to put Odric in the firing line. And that does trigger Adeline. It makes two more 1-1s. One so Adeline is currently a 13-6. We'll block Odric with our Shieldred. We'll have to take the rest. That knocks us down to 14. That also triggers their Sword of Feast and Famine. It does trigger our Yehenny as well. We'll just discard the land. Now they play a land for turn, an Ancient Tomb. And then they recast their commander again. And that is it for their turn. We draw High Market for turn. That triggers Shieldred. We gain two life. So we'll start by playing High Market for turn. That comes into play tapped. Next, we're going to sack our Shieldred, the one we should have sacked before. That triggers Radadrab again, Dark Prophecy. We draw a Brought back. So a Shieldred token comes back into play. Yehenny gains Indestructible. Real shame about our opponent having that Archon of Ameria out there because we could have done quite a bit this turn. Even potentially the previous turn. So we may not end up winning this game. But if we're going to go down, at least we're going to go out swinging and do something pretty cool. So what I think we'll do is we'll start by casting our Reanimate target in Shieldred. And then we're going to pass the turn there. Phyrexian Arena triggers on the Sliver Queen's upkeep. Now when they draw a card, they're going to lose 4 life thanks to our 2 Shieldreds. Then they'll gain 1 life back because of the Chimera. Now when they draw for turn, they're going to lose another 4 life. And gain 1 back. They play a land for turn. Now they are just moving to their end step and they do have 7 mana up. So there is every chance that they may have a Cyclonic Rift in hand. Now my plan for the end step here is to actually sack Shieldred, sack Yehenny itself and then cast Brought back. So we can bring back both of them using our commander. Now if we do that, that is going to put us lower on cards. But we will draw because of Dark Prophecy. So it might not be that bad. So look, we don't know if they definitely have it in hand. I think we've got to try this anyway. Regardless, if they cast a Cyclonic Rift, that's actually good for us. I think that brings us back in the game. So let's give it a go anyway. So we'll sack Shieldred. That triggers Dark Prophecy and Radadrabic. We draw a Lend of the Dusk Rose. That's going to gain us four life. And then now we're going to sack Yehenny. That will also trigger Dark Prophecy, Radadrabic again. We'll draw a card. A Grim Harispex. That gains us four life. And now we're going to cast Brought back. We'll bring back our Shieldred and Yehenny. Now they do come into play tapped, and that is going to be our bit of fun before we go to the Odric player's turn. Now on Odric's draw step, they will lose 6 life, but they don't mess around, they just move straight to combat. They'll only have to swing Adeline towards us, because then they'll have enough damage with the tokens that she makes. So Adeline is coming our way, but they're just playing it safe and sending all their human tokens as well. In fact, they're actually sending their entire board our way. While well, they do decide to pull back the Grand Abolisher and put it towards the Sliver Queen. Adeline triggers, making two extra 1-1s. One now they also cast Swords to Plowshares, targeting the Horizon Chimera. Let's see if the Sliver Queen does actually have the Cyclonic Rift. They'll most likely wait until we're dead before they do use it anyway. It makes the most sense. That's if they do have it. They are thinking about this, so they definitely have something in their hand. But that does go through. The Sliver Queen player is taking their time here thinking about what they're going to be doing, so... I'm wondering if they are thinking of whether they want to save us or not. I mean, if they have Cyclonic Rift in hand, they probably don't need our help to <laughs> take out the Odric player. Especially seeing as they have zero cards in hand and the Sliver Queen player has seven. And really, our Shieldreds are going to hurt them a lot. So we're taken out of the game. So now we move to the Sliver Queen player's turn. 
And now they cast a Chroma's Vengeance. Destroy all artifacts, creatures, and enchantments. So it looks like they did have the board wipe. They were just putting their bets on us being taken out first, which was actually quite a smart play. It was risky, but it definitely paid off for them. And so now the Sliver Queen is definitely in the driver's seat here. They're in a very strong position to be able to take the game here, just due to the raw amount of resources they have. More lands and more cards in hand. Now they also play a Bajuka Bog for turn, so that's going to exile the Odric player's graveyard. So this game turned around quite quickly. And that is it for their turn. Alright, let's see if the Odric player can pull off a miracle here. But it seems like the game is pretty much already decided. Odric just plays a Mother of Runes for turn. Tap at target creature you control gains protection from the color of your choice until end of turn. And that's going to be it for them. The Sliver Queen player starts by casting their commander. You can pay two mana as much as you want to create a 1-1 one, one colorless Sliver creature token. And then they follow that up with an Elixir of Immortality. Two tap, you gain five life, then you shuffle it in your graveyard into its library. They are activating that straight away. And they finish that up by playing a tap land for turn, which is going to allow them to scry one. And that is it for their turn. Odric plays a Recruiter of the Guard. When it ETBs, you can search your library for a creature card with toughness two or less, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle. Okay, well the tutor's always good. Let's see what they find. And they find themselves a Ranger of Eos. Next, they cast the Ranger of Eos. When it ETBs, you can search your library for up to two creature cards with mana value one or less, reveal them, put them into your hand, and then shuffle. They find themselves an Alcide of Life's Bounty and a Weathered Wayfarer. Now they tap to give their Ranger of Eos protection. And now they move to combat, swinging in at the Sliver Queen player. Well, this is going to be a race of life totals. Maybe the Odric player can get there if the Sliver Queen can't respond to these creatures being able to get in unblocked. That does knock them down to 11. And that's it for their turn. Sliver Queen starts by casting Honden of Seen Winds. At the beginning of your upkeep, draw a card for each shrine you control. Alright, well that was definitely something I wasn't expecting. The Sliver Queen deck to actually be a shrine deck. They play a tap land for turn. That allows them to scry one. And now they move to combat, sending in their 7-7 commander. Odric blocks with their recruiter. And that is it for their turn. Odric starts by playing Palace Jailer. When it ETBs, you become the monarch. When it also ETBs, exile target creature and opponent controls until an opponent becomes the monarch. Alright, well, that's an answer to the Sliver Queen for at least another turn. So that does buy them a little more time. So I might have spoken too soon. The Odric player might actually have the, the chance to get this. Oh, it looks like we do have a response here from the Sliver Queen player, though. They just decide to make a 1-1 Sliver token. And it's likely they'll do that again. And they do. The ability resolves, so the Sliver Queen goes back to the command zone. Now, they also cast Alcide of Life's Bounty. You can pay one sack at target creature or enchantment you control gains protection from the color of your choice until end of turn. And they also cast a Weathered Wayfarer. Now, they move to combat. They send in their Ranger towards the Sliver Queen player. Notably, protection won't help them because the slivers are colorless. So they can block with them if they want to. And they do. They actually decide to block with both slivers. So the ranger and the two slivers go down. And now because they are the monarch, they get to draw a card at their end step. Which right now is very important for them. The sliver queen player still has five cards in hand. Now, the Honden does trigger on their upkeep. So they get to draw a card, which will be currently one because they have one shrine. They also draw for turn, so that takes them back up to 7 cards in hand. They play a tap land for turn. And now they just recast their commander. And that is their turn done. Odric starts by activating their Weathered Wayfarer. So they're going to go search their library for a land card. And they get themselves a Nykthos Shrine to Nyx. And that's going to be quite good at the moment. They'll currently be able to make 5 mana from that. And they also tap the Hall of the Bandit Lord, taking them down to 2 life. Oh, they decide to reverse that. And now they start by casting Archivist of Ogma. Whenever an opponent searches their library, you gain one life and draw a card. Now they activate their Nykthos, taking them up to 7 white mana in total. They also tap their Hall of the Bandit Lord, so their life total is down to 2. And it's likely we see their commander come down here. And we do. Odric is back on the field. Notably because the Alcide does have lifelink, it is going to give the rest of their creatures lifelink, which is going to help them rebuild that life total back up. He also comes down with haste, so he will be able to swing himself. So now their creatures currently have haste and lifelink. Looks like we have a response from the Sliver Queen player. And they cast Naya Charm. Tap all creatures target player controls. Okay, that's actually quite a good response. That's going to get them the game right there. Wow, what a card that they held on to. So let's see if the Odric player has any responses here, but I highly doubt it. In response, they do tap their Mother of Runes, giving their commander protection. 
It won't matter though, they all do get tapped down. Now they move to their end step. Monarch triggers, they do draw a card. And now we go to the Sliver Queen player's turn. The Honden does trigger, they get to draw a card for the shrine they control. Now they just move straight to combat. They swing in with their commander. And that is the game done there, guys. All right, let's go to the review and discuss what happened. So that was a really great game. The Odric player got off to a strong start, and they maintained that strong position for most of the game, applying more and more pressure with their creatures. The Maelstrom Wanderer player was the first victim of the Odric player, and it was clear they were their biggest perceived threat. Now as a Maelstrom pilot myself, I know that if an opponent does apply a lot of pressure to you early, it can be really hard to recover, especially once the damage has been done. Once the Wanderer player was out of the game, we were starting to establish a strong board state, but unfortunately the Odric player was simply too far ahead by the time it mattered. The Sliver Queen player, however, successfully bided their time, waited for the Odric player to take us out, and then cast their board wipe so they could put themselves into a lead in position. After a commendable rebuilding of the Odric player's board state, it almost seemed like they were going to be able to take the game. But once again, the Sliver Queen player had a trick up their sleeve, and once the Odric player was all tapped out, that Naya charm was the final nail in the coffin that allowed them to take the game. Well, that's it from me today. I hope you enjoyed what I thought was a great game, and although we didn't win, I hope you saw just enough spice that convinced you to build Radadrabic yourself. Until next time, guys.